This video is sponsored by Feed to Dell. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. Now, over the past few months, I've been hearing more and more about cryptocurrencies. I originally heard of Bitcoin two years ago, but it wasn't until last year that I really tried to understand it and what the hype was about. And well, it turns out there isn't just something called Bitcoin, but there's something called Ethereum and altcoins, and yeah, I pretty much fell down a rabbit hole. And the more I learned about it, the more I realised it was less about some get-rich-quick scheme, but to me it was more about the underpinning technology and its applications. But, I mean, at the same time, I can't ignore the fact that some people seem to have made a lot of money from it. However, many want to do something impactful with their wealth. For example, you may have heard of the creator behind the Ethereum blockchain and youngest known crypto billionaire, Vitalik Buterin, who donated at least at the time, around $1 billion to the India Covid Relief Fund, and who has also donated millions to other charities, including the Methuselah Foundation, a non-profit medical charity focused on extending the healthy human lifespan. But he's just one example of many. So, whilst I have a somewhat beginner's understanding of blockchain and decentralised technologies, there isn't only what I'm going to talk about in this video, because there's probably way more knowledgeable people than me who can explain that in much more detail. Instead, I thought it'd be cooler to see how the use of this technology could be applied to academic research, how it can aid with funding for research projects, and how everyone can be involved, whether you're a researcher, a longevity enthusiast, a crypto enthusiast, or all three. So in this video, we'll have a general overview of some of the challenges that are faced in research and what's being done to address them. And to discuss this later part, I'll introduce you to the work that Fita Dao are trying to do, my thoughts on it, and how you can get involved. Now, as much as I love being a researcher, and I love science, there are definitely some challenges in scientific research. None of these challenges are necessarily constrained to longevity research, but scientific research more broadly. But longevity research itself aligns well with crypto, since both have previously been and continue to be dismissed due to their high risk nature. Now, arguably one of the major issues in research is funding, because, well, research is expensive. From the basic research that I do, where a tiny tube of liquid containing some protein inhibitor could literally cost thousands, to the endless usage of pipette tips and cell culture media, these all add up. Plus there's paying the researchers, building maintenance, and then think about clinical trials and how, as the scale doubles, the cost can literally multiply. In particular, in the context of longevity research, power comes in numbers, and data quality is so important when it comes to taking more measurements, and then you want to have more biomarkers, and yeah, that cost just keeps rising. So I think you get the gist, research isn't cheap, but the problem is, where does that funding come from, and how much funding is available to different research groups or institutions? And the thing is, funding availability will affect what research is undertaken, which therefore affects what data is published and also affects how many risks are taken. Because if you've got endless amounts of funding, you're more likely to be a bit risky because you can. <laughs> and the thing is, if you've got limited funding, it will bias you to do safe, more predictable science that's more likely to get published when you're more likely to then get grants to then get more funding to then keep doing the same kind of thing. And so you will kind of end up in this kind of perpetual trap where funding really does dictate a lot of what happens in research. And the thing is, it isn't necessarily the funding itself, how much funding there is available, but also how that funding is allocated, and how those decisions are actually made, and what kind of criteria are used to make those judgments. And so I've thought about this a lot and discussed it with many different friends, and it seems that funding does come down to the root cause of many of the different individual problems that face the structure that implicates scientific research. So I feel like I haven't really given too many different problems that are in research because in reality that really does deserve its own kind of video which may or may not be that relevant or interesting to you. But basically I think if money wasn't a worry or an issue with scientific research, a lot of the other problems would be alleviated. So besides the fact that there are some individuals who have accumulated a lot of wealth through cryptocurrencies, is there anything actually about the blockchain itself and the technologies that underpin cryptocurrencies that could actually help solve some of these problems in scientific research, in this case in the context of longevity research? Well, I said I wasn't going to try and explain blockchain, but I think it is kind of necessary to do so to understand why it has great potential for longevity research. 
So blockchain is a technology that was first developed for Bitcoin back in 2008. And essentially, in the simplest way I can explain it without being incorrect, it is a chain of blocks that track and manage data. In the case of Bitcoin, that would be transactions. The metaphorical chain of blocks creates the ledger that has a complete chronological record of the data. An interesting analogy is actually cancer evolution, whereby one cell acquires mutation, replicates and acquires secondary, tertiary, and so on, mutations, as it keeps dividing to form a tumour, with all subsequent cells having a record of the initial offence, the previous mutations. In that case, the first block would be that first cell that got the first mutation. Anyway, another cool aspect of blockchain is that it is decentralised, which basically means that activities of an organisation like decision making are distributed rather than a central authoritative group. So you have distributed control. These fundamentals are why there is so much interest in it. Blockchain enables security, anonymity and data integrity without any third party organisation and control. So hopefully that wasn't too bad of an introduction. But what has any of this got to do with longevity? Well, some potential applications involve being able to use blockchain technology to record securely clinical trial data and DNA sequencing results, and this could potentially be important for achieving personalised medicine. But what other applications are there? Well, this is where Fisa Dow comes in, as their vision is to create a world where longevity therapeutics are collectively funded, owned, and governed by the population that will benefit them. Fisa Dow planned to be the world's first decentralised intellectual property collective, or to be more technical, a Web3 based decentralised autonomous organisation. So that's where the Dow comes from. And the best way to understand all of this is through the Fisa Dow ecosystem, which you can see here. This ecosystem has an open structure, which basically means that it's accessible to anyone who has Fisa Dow tokens. You can get tokens in exchange for funds, as you can see here. All tokens can be awarded for contributing work through expertise or from preclinical data, making research proposals or taking part in voting, and this will help to incentivize the community aspect, as ownership of the FetaDAO tokens effectively makes you a co-owner of FetaDAO, such that you can participate in the governance of FetaDAO, direct research and can make proposals to vote on. And so the money raised through buying of these tokens can then be used to fund research and commercialise longevity therapeutics. And so after projects have been submitted and the community has voted over which projects to fund, the selected researchers will get that funding and in exchange for the funding, they give intellectual property ownership in the data that results from the project to feed DAO. The results are therefore the assets which can then be licensed out to third parties for commercialisation like pharmaceutical companies and this is done in a decentralised way. And so it's this ecosystem that makes FetaDAO unique. It differs from the traditional norms of how funding is allocated for research. FetaDAO will own the intellectual property resulting from its projects. And to join, you either contribute work or funds. And the idea is that this will enable early stage, high risk, high reward longevity projects to be funded. With current estimates ranging from $50,000 to $1 million dollars, with funding decisions being made within two to three weeks. Ultimately, this will help to build a large community of academics and researchers via a global incentive scheme, since researchers get funding for research. And so it's important to emphasise that the researchers are kind of key for FetaDAO to function. But it's also this community-driven focus that excites me about it, as it makes the research more transparent and enables more people to contribute. Now, FetaDAO is in its early stages, and so it'll be interesting to see how people react to the idea, and also it'll be interesting to see how the system plays out, and whether it'll be better suited for some research labs than others, as there could be a bias for labs that frequently use preclinical models, and so other labs that are at even earlier stages of research may be excluded. Moreover, it seems a little unclear to me what would happen in a situation where funding is allocated to a lab that doesn't get any intellectual property that can then be commercialised. And maybe down the line it'll be interesting to see if there's plans to fund people as opposed to just funding projects. But the idea is ambitious, but if successful I think it will have a large impact on how science is conducted. 
And as I don't fully understand the underlying fundamentals behind FetaDAO, such as the Web3 based DAO system or the underlying tokenomics, I don't think I can have a strong intuition over whether this is the best protocol for the task. But whether FetaDAO or an alternative protocol that improves upon their pitfalls, it reminds me of a quote from one of my favourite films, Ratatouille. But there are times when a critic truly risks something, and that is in the discovery and defence of the new. The world is often unkind to new talent, new creations. The new needs friends. Now, just to be clear, we're talking about FetaDAO here, not eating dinner cooked by a rat. But as I've said, I don't know how everything will pan out, but I am supportive of their intentions and excited by the fact that this could be something extraordinary. So with that, I'd like to thank FetaDAO for sponsoring this video. It's great that they appreciate the science communication I do on this channel, so do check out their website. FetaDAO will be launching very soon, so you'll find a link to their website in the description, and I'd encourage you to take a look at their white paper and go join their Discord and forum. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, and thank you for listening.